Hey everyone, welcome back to another deal analysis episode. So today we're gonna to be talking about a fourplex in Westminster, Colorado. And this was a transaction that I personally bought and also acted as the agent. So this is a uh, fourplex I bought back in quarter three of 2019. And I'm finally getting around to do a deal analysis on it. So the backstory on this, uh, this was a property I purchased in a 1031 exchange. I bought a property years ago out of state that I lived in for a year or two, then turned to a rental. And two things had happened. I've had since moved away from Nevada, now live in Colorado, so I don't like having out of state properties. And also that property just became a very poor rental property, meaning the rents kind of stayed flat, but the property about tripled in value. So I had lots of equity on there, mostly from market appreciation. And also, you know, I probably paid down a good chunk of the mortgage uh, just from the, it was on a 15 year mortgage. So I had to pay down about, uh, you know, seven, eight years of principal reduction. So quite a bit of equity in there that I wanted to optimize and also bring back to Denver. So before I even listed my property in Reno, I started trying to line up a replacement property out here in Denver. Because if you're not familiar with a 1031 exchange, what that is, is that's um, that's a reference to an IRS tax code. It's, you know, line 1031 or something like that. But what that does is it allows a real estate investor to sell one property and buy another property and basically defer their capital gains. Because normally if I would have sold that property in Reno, Nevada, I would owe capital gains, which would be quite a bit because the market appreciated. But since I did a 1031 exchange, I'm able to defer those taxes and not pay anything. And you can keep doing that over and over again uh, for many, many properties, or basically what most people's plans are to do it until they die. So I want to do a 1031 exchange to minimize the capital gains taxes because otherwise I would have paid, I think it was like maybe like forty-five or fifty thousand dollars in capital gains. So I mean a big, big chunk of money that I was able to fortunately keep in my pocket. But the thing you have to keep on with 1031 exchanges is that you have tight deadlines for them. So once my property sold in Nevada, I had 45 days to identify another property and 180, 180 days to close on that property. So in reality, that means I had you know about a month to get a property under contract and get through inspection to make sure that I wanted to move forward with the property. Because once you're past that 45 day mark, there really isn't any going back. So that's the backstory on how 10 through 1031 exchange works. And so I started trying to find a replacement property. Just say, hey, cool, you know, who who needs to sell their property? Who's got what coming up? Just because it's always worthwhile to start throwing that out there. And that's what we always do uh, when we have clients in 1031 exchange is we start timing things up uh, so we can hopefully match our timelines. Since usually if we're buying an investment property, like a multi-unit, the seller is often doing a 1031 exchange as well. So they know the game and they wanna be considerate of their own 1031 exchange deadlines. So uh, I found someone that was selling this property and we could both be flexible in our timelines to make it work for my timeline and also work for their timeline. So I like this property because it was fully rehabbed. Uh, they had bought this, did a full rehab on it. They spent like close to $200,000 rehabbing it and not just cosmetic, but the full uh, sewer, you know, uh, new sewer, new windows, uh, new plumbing, uh, just lots of new everything on there. And then really I had about and $175,000 to place for my 1031 exchange. So I wanted to uh, get only buy one property with it versus trying to buy three or four properties. Just because the less moving parts there are, the less risk there is in something going wrong in a 1031 exchange. Because if I was gonna go out there and buy four condos, which have better cap rates than our cash flows, but then I'm dug, you know, juggling four different transactions, if one falls apart, uh, well, then I have to go back there and scramble. So I want to do one property for simplicity and just less stress on my mind here. So the profile for me getting on with this is that I'm a buy and hold investor with a goal of buying at least one property a year. And my general goals are I want a property in the Denver metro area. I want something above a 6% cap rate. And ideally, I like turnkey properties, which means they need minimal work. So I found this property through networking, which is where uh, more than half the properties we find for multifamilies, they actually come through our networking. So as I said, I just, you know, months out, I started network networking with people saying, hey, who's selling something? I got this. How can we make a deal? And then I was able to put this deal together. 
So the details of this property is it's uh, located in Westminster. So it's east of Federal, I'm sorry, west of Federal, east of Sheridan, and right around 72nd Avenue, which is just a few blocks south of, um, of 36. So there's a lot of multi-units in that location. So good area, good location. And I really like this four unit. And there's probably about 10 of them with the same layout. You know, they're all built back in, I think it was the 1960s or so. And so the way it's laid out is there's four units, but rather than being an up down fourplex, where you have two units up top and two units on bottom, these are actually townhouse style units. So every townhouse is basically one corner of the building and they are two bedrooms and 1.5 bathrooms. So uh, everyone has, you know, you walk in there on the ground floor entrance, you walk in, you've got a living room, closet, kitchen, washer, dryer, and a half bath. Go up the stairs, you have two bedrooms and you have a full bathroom up there. And so all four of these units are identical. And then each unit has, as I said, in your washer and dryer, then also a uh, furnace as well, so they control their heat. So I know the sellers, I cannot remember the exact amount they were gonna sell it for, but it was either eight seventy-five dollars to $900,000 or what they were targeting to sell it for. And just because I could come in and they know it'd be an easier transaction with me, I could make the work perfectly for their timeline. I was able to get it for eight fifty. So this is not uncommon for when we do off-market uh, deals. Sometimes we're gonna get the property below what the original sales price were because if there's reduced marketing costs, reduced time, reduced stress, that's usually worth money to many investors out there. So talking about again why I liked it, um, it was a complete rehab property. Uh, so like I said, it wasn't just cosmetic, it was a, a full rehab. And it was actually located in an opportunity zone, which is those federally, or those uh, areas that states have designated that get uh, favorable federal tax treatment. So I'm not taking advantage of the opportunity zone tax credits or the whole tax plan there, but my hopes are, and this was just a big fat cheer on the top for me, was that other bigger investors are with a lot more money than I have, they're doing it, which should hopefully just you know improve the whole area over the next decade, and I can hopefully ride their coattails. So moving on to the contract details, um, as I said, this was something I actually got under contract before my property in Reno had sold, and I basically already had a you know a verbal agreement or a handshake agreement on the terms, the timeline, and everything before I even listed my property in Reno. And we just agreed upon it and said, hey, once I actually get my property listed and that goes under contract, we'll write the contract for this place just to make sure there are no crazy curveballs. So we did that. My place in Reno, Nevada, you know, not surprising or not uncommon. I forget what happened. I think there was inspection or lending. No, it was a lending item. And so the original close date got pushed back a week or two, but that had you know no bearance or no impact on the property I was buying out here in Westminster because that property closed, I want to say right around like May 1st, but I didn't close on this fourplex until towards the end of August. So you're talking May, June, July, August, so you know almost four months later. So that fit within the 45-day and 188-day timelines uh, for the 1031 exchange. So I got under contract below the original ask price or thinking of. And to, you know, I wanted to make sure that I would be protected. And they also wanted to make sure that they're going to sell the property. So we wrote the contract deadline. So those, you know, the, the hard deadlines of inspection and lending, those got passed before the 45 day window. That way they knew I was committed. And that way I knew they were committed. So there's definitely a little bit of risk there, uh, but it's very low risk. And I was much happier to take that than have uh, possibly go on my, go past my 1031 timeline. So I did the you know normal inspection and sewer scope items, and there was really no inspection concerns. I mean, the few things on the inspection report were uh, change the furnace filters. There were some missing caulk in some of the bathrooms. I mean, just it was minimal stuff. So I didn't even you know there was nothing for me to submit because it was all just very minimal stuff. Um, and this was a you know a, a fully rehab property and really really nice. So no inspection negotiation outcomes. And so for lending, I went with a 30-year conventional uh, fixed loan. And so those loans require a 25% down payment. 
Now, if I had gone through like a local bank, they can do a 20% down payment, but then it's doing a, an adjustable rate mortgage. So that's, you know, five or seven years of a fixed rate mortgage. So I thought about that, but I ultimately ended up leaning towards a 30 year fixed because even though the interest rate was a little bit higher, I like the idea of having it fixed for the long term, just as like a safety net for, you know, 10 years out for interest rate risk. So I put 25% down and my interest rate was five and a quarter. Now, the first appraisal came in incredibly low. Like, I uh, said, so we were in a contract for 850. The first appraisal came in at something around like 680 or 690. I mean, it was $170,000 less than the, um, than the actual you know, the contract price. And frankly, and this is not me complaining as a buyer or me complaining as a realtor, but it truly was a junk appraisal. Um, you know, the, the lender reviewed it, thought so. We had the appraisal company review it. They agreed with it as well. I mean, it just didn't make any sense because this property, yes, it was going to be probably one of the most expensive properties sold in that area. But if you looked at the comps, I mean, there were other similar styles to this building, like, you know, across the street that sold for $700,000. But the rents were $400 less per unit. And it was updated back in the 80s, and they said somehow that appraised for more, or that was worth more than the uh, the property that I was buying, which made zero sense with higher rents and a fully rehab property. So at another appraisal, appraiser go back to it. You know, we contested it. Took about a week for it to go through. Another appraiser came back, and this appraiser or this appraisal was spot on, or at least much better, and actually came in above the contract amount. So that was really nice. And so as far as appraisers or appraisals, that was the biggest spread I've ever experienced in my time as an agent. I mean, that was almost a $200,000 appraisal uh, gap spread. So that was a significant amount and definitely made me lose sleep there for a night or two as we were dealing with this because the appraisal came back like, I don't know, like 10 days before my 45 day timeline that was up for my 1031. And I was like, man, well, <laughs> Ah, what do I do if it doesn't go through? So luckily it came out and it worked, but it definitely caused uh, more stress than I was hoping for. But that's the way it goes sometimes. So no seller concessions, no mortgage insurance since I'm putting down 25%. And I did buy the interest rate down uh, some to get down to that five and a quarter. So running through the numbers here, uh, I'm plugging into Joe Massey's spreadsheet here. So I've actually got the spreadsheet saved in my computer and I just took a few screenshots to put it here in the PowerPoint slides. So if you want to see the spreadsheet, email me or click the show notes or the link in the show notes. And these screenshots will also be put on the blog post there as well. So I put down 25%, uh, which required about, I don't know, was that, uh, actually I think all in between the down payment, the acquisition cost and loan cost, it was all in for about almost $225,000 for easy math. So my replace my property sold in Nevada, I walked with like $175,000 and I put an extra $40,000 to make up for it. So the vast majority of it came from my 1031 exchange. And one of the key things to know about 1031s is that you need to use all the money. If you don't use it, you'll get taxed on it. So it's always better to use the money and then bring on additional money to close on the property. So I got it at 5.25% interest over 30 year fixed. And then the rents and uh, the rents on here were really good. And these also include rubs. So, uh, you know, some type of like residential utility bill back system. And so the numbers I'm about to give you, those are the rents. Plus they have a hundred dollars extra added on there for uh, utility reimbursements. And I think one of them had an extra $50 a month for a pet lease. Uh, or something like that. So a few more dollars for a pet lease as well. So $1,600, $1,650, $1,700, $1,650. So for a grand total, about $6,600 a month. So very, very strong numbers there as far as like rental income. I put vacancy at 5% when I do multifamilies. Uh, annual rent increase, appreciation rate, I do 3%. And I put in 25% for my effective tax rate. So going on down to the monthly operating expenses, I selected yes to property management. Now my PM actually charged me uh, just about 7%, but I put in 10% to round up for other costs, you know, uh, just other fees they have, turnover fees, leasing fees, things like that. So that's an extra 3% I'm putting in there, just to help cover some cost. 
The monthly maintenance reserves, I put in 8%. Now in reality, I actually expect this to be more along the lines of like three to 5% per year for the first number of years, just because it really is a fully rehab property. So I think it actually should be an actual lower number. Uh, but after year, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, it should be closer to like an 8% in the average. And that's for, you know, repairs and also putting away for reserves. But, you know, with no matter what property you buy, because we often buy rehab properties right now. And I always tell my clients, hey, we should expect to see a lower repairs number. But there's also a chance that we will see, um, you know, it's tenants, things go wrong. It, it might go back up of 8%. You might have a bad year. And there's always stuff like, for example, on this property, I mean, on the three months after I bought it, uh, I think it was the first snow of the year, had the snow company come out and their snow plow, because there's a there's like a four car parking lot on there, their snow plow somehow scooped up the water main or the water main lid, you know, that metal lid that goes in the concrete. Because what the previous owners did, they actually, re, uh, they put down new concrete on the road and I from looking at the photos and looking at it myself, it looks like that the lip was not done correctly so that the metal plate was sticking up just slightly. So when the, you know, the metal snow plow scooped it up, it pulled it away. Well, that turned into one of these just, you know, silly fiascos where uh, the city of Westminster came out and, you know, that lid was from, I guess, the 1960s. Well, they don't make lids that size anymore. So for about three months, there was just a hole in the sidewalk while they were trying to figure out what to do. So we put a cone out there and I just, you know, hope that no one hurt themselves on it. And luckily no one did. But then after a couple months of that, they came out there and repaired it. And then I was responsible for patching the concrete around it. Well, then you know, to, to patch, you know, 20 inches of concrete was a $600 job. And so I'm not there with concrete. And that was, you know, a, a pain in the butt. So I share that story because there's always stuff that pops up with rental properties. So that still should fall below my 5% uh, repairs and maintenance for the year. But maybe I go higher. So I'd like to do 8% to do very conservative underwriting. There is no HOA. Uh, the real estate taxes are $3,596. My property insurance is about uh, $1,550. So just under $1,600 there. Uh, the water and sewer averages about, so far, about $120 a month. And so it's pretty low. And, you know, part of the reason it's low is because there's, you know, high efficiency uh, water appliances in there. And also I have no lawn irrigation. So, um, you know, probably be, actually that number looks wrong. It should be more like $1,300, $1,400 for the year, not uh, $1,140. So water and sewer will be a few dollars higher on my spreadsheet. Trash is about $90 a month for trash and recycling. And there's a dumpster that's, I think, picked up twice a, a month electric or i should say excel so all the units have individual electrical meters there's five meters four for the properties and then one for the common areas for me the landlord but then there's one water or one water and sewer tap and one gas uh, line so then i pay for the gas and the water heaters are gas and the furnaces are gas so obviously a lot more expensive excel bill in the winter time when the water heaters and furnaces are running more uh, but it looks like it should average out to be about 3000 a year or so for, you know, the common Excel bill. For landscaping, there's a whole lot of landscaping to do, but there is that snow removal. And there will be some basic landscaping to do. I think it will be about 1000 bucks a year is my estimate. So going on to the next tab of the spreadsheet here for this rental analysis, uh, my total annual expenses are about $25,000. So that leaves me with a net operating income of just under $50,000. So when you take my debt payment on there, it comes out to be about $42,000 for the year. So my annual cash flow before taxes is about $7,500. So that gives me a 3.2% cash on cash return and a 5.8% cap rate. So I'm much more of a cap rate person, so I always like to look at cap rates. So having a, you know, a rehab multi-unit that's close to a, that's a high five cap rate, that's a really good deal in the current market. So I was really happy with this property. A couple of notes about here, just kind of talking about these numbers some more, that's really interesting. So I bought this in August of last year, and I just recently finished a refinance on this property. I took advantage of when interest rates really dipped there back in February or March. Can't quite remember, but when they dipped there a while ago, uh, I refinanced this property and I got down to a 3.625% interest rate. So, I mean, that's almost a, about a point and a half drop. 
So I have to bring some cash to closing in order to pay for closing costs, to buy the rate down a little bit. So I think it was about $11,000 for closing to refinance. But here's the kicker. That refinance is gonna save me just over $600 a month in principal and interest payments. So that's about $7,200 a year. So that's less than a two year payback period. And since I plan on holding this property for at least about seven to 10 years, um, it makes a lot of sense. So with that right there, you can look at, hey, it saves me money, or it increases my cash flow by about $7,000 a year. And that would, you know, almost uh, bring my cash flow probably to fifteen to sixteen dollars to $17,000 a year. Now, kind of taking one more step back, talking about my cash flow, before this refinance, I had about $7,400 uh, underwritten. I really expected to be closer to be about $1,000 a month. And this was before my refinance because I expect uh, the repairs and maintenance to be much lower. And I also expect my actual property management fees to be lower as well. So if I actually lower those, it should probably be closer to about $1,000 a month is what I'm hoping for. But kind of being the conservative longer term model, it'll be maybe $600, $700 a month or about $7,400 a year, which I'm happy with. I'd always be, I'd always rather be more conservative in underwriting uh, than be too liberal on there. But now with the refinance, I mean, that's going to be an extra seven, eight thousand dollars a year that I save in. So overall, I really like this property. Uh, very happy with it as my 1031 exchange replacement. Uh, so yeah, if you guys have questions on this, reach out to me. If you want to see the spreadsheet, reach out to me. If you need help with understanding 1031 exchange, reach out to me. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not that hard to do, but there are a lot of moving parts. And it's one of those things where you want to know everything before you start selling the pro selling your replacement property because there's so many moving parts downstream that if we get something backwards or we get t pushed up against deadlines that's where we can run into difficulty so thank you for listening if you got any questions reach out